because we didn't get to dwell on it too long. And it's actually a very important pivot point thematically for where we'll be going starting in Genesis chapter 12. So last week we went through a lot of genealogical material. It got us from Noah to Abraham. And here we're listing the descendants of Shem who are the ancestors of the lineage of Abraham. And then this verses 27 through 32 is that pivot point where we continue the genealogy in part. We're told that these are the descendants of Terah, but then there's a little bit more narrative than what we were typically getting in the genealogy, where now we have some names of women and we're told that Abram had a wife. It's not yet Sarah in the Hebrew, Sarai, I, Sarai, Sarai, Sarai. Um, and that she is barren and was without child. So what's happening here is we're going from this history of creation, the history of humanity, and we're going to narrow down into a history of the Israelite people. So from primeval history to what we would consider more historical material. And what's happening in chapters 1 through 11 is that the end result of this, of this grand creation that has fallen and gone through these moments of chaos from Cain killing his brother to the earth being so evil that God sends the waters of the flood to this tower of Babel where everyone is dispersed, is that somehow this beautiful creation has now become barren. This is not just about Sarah being barren, but it is instead about the barrenness of humanity. And what happens in this moment of barrenness? Is there anything that can come out? And so we're going to be going from these chapters that may be what we would consider the chapters of the curse. 1 through 11 talk about the aftermath of the curse that come to Adam and Eve resulting in this moment of barrenness, but we are then going to transition instead to chapters of the blessing. And so Abram or Abraham is going to be a major thematic point within the gospels as well. And so Abraham is going to be referenced often um, within the New Testament texts. And so just thinking of some of these texts, um, for example, Zechariah, um, I'm sorry, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, this tax collector, um, in this moment of redemption in the face of Jesus, is told that he is a son of Abraham. And then we get the story of Lazarus at the gate, where this poor man is begging at a gate, and a rich man comes, and the poor man begs for relief, the rich man ignores him. Eventually, they both die, and this is a parable. And the uh, rich man is suffering and looks up into the heavens, and there at the bosom of Abraham is the poor man who had been begging for relief, who finds it in the arms of Abraham. Uh, we have other stories, again, where those who are marginalized and oppressed are referred to as the sons and daughters of Abraham, meaning they are the sons and daughters of the blessing. That in their moment of need, in their moment of redemption, they're reminded that they come from a heritage of blessing, that out of barrenness can come something new, something beautiful. This is a story of resurrection before the resurrection of Christ, that out of barrenness, comes hope. So we get this in verse 30. We're then told that Abram and his grandson Lot go out together from Ur the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. They came to Haran and they settled there. And so I mentioned at the very end last week that this is a story of people in a foreign land that is not their home. All right, let's start chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, 
And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's actually a, a lot there in just those few verses. So first, what's interesting to me is that this is not a God of being sedentary. This is not a God who says the blessing comes to you when you are in the place designed for you and everything is okay and you've got everything you need and now here's your blessing, you're safe, everything's okay. Instead, this is a God who gives the blessing and the promise on the move. Go from the land that you are used to, that is comfortable to you, where you are settled. You need to leave that in order to receive the blessing. So this God is always moving, always going to new places. And the faith of Abraham is to trust that the blessing will come despite the barrenness. Abraham has no reason to believe in the blessing at this moment, has no reason to think that God is going to somehow make him a great nation. How could he become a great nation if he doesn't even have anyone to pass it on to? There are no descendants yet. And so the promise is coming in the midst of the barrenness with no evidence that there's anything to hope from. The blessing is coming in the midst of being on the move, of leaving everything that is familiar and comfortable. I think that can definitely translate to our own experiences, that we have to leave what's comfortable, to leave what feels settled in order to experience something new. And the promise of this blessing is not just for Abraham, um, but something, again, that will be picked up in the New Testament as the good news of Christ is being brought to all the nations, is that this blessing is supposed to be so great that it goes from Abraham and his people to all the peoples of the earth. This is a blessing for everyone. Questions or comments about those first three verses there? Yeah, Shirley? And this is, is, is gets to the point that we've had before, you know, God talking to people, but it was more fictionalized. Here we're talking about something historical. And the question would be, you know, is this a special talking to Abram, um, or is it just his feeling? And we, we know later when he has his son, he's taking him up the mountain, and, and he believes he knew what God said, and maybe it is what God said or not, but then it got changed. And so it's like, um, is this how the Israelites saw God as speaking very clearly to people, or was that a unique thing? Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really good and complicated question. Mm -hmm. So Shirley's question is, as we move into something more historical here, we have God speaking to Abram, and how is Abram discerning the voice of God? Is this God speaking directly to Abram? Is this Abram having a feeling of what God is saying? Is this how the Israelites understood communication with God, is that there was some sort of clear voice that spoke to Abram, because then we're going to have the story of the binding of Isaac. And did God really tell um, Abram to go and to sacrifice his son? We also have, a, you know, having different, different taking concubines, doing whatever to try to get this child that he wants to have in his son. So he does kind of not just clearly get a message. Right, right. And Shirley points out, we're going to have Abram taking matters into his own hands um, with Hagar to try to get this descendant. Um, so he's not having this clear, direct, daily communication with God. Surely, the reason this is a great question is that it is one that is teased out throughout all of Scripture. How does someone actually hear the voice of God? Um, it's something that our main characters are going to struggle with. It's something that the prophets of Israel are going to struggle with. What does it mean for a prophet to speak in his or her own name versus the name of God? We're going to have, um, I was just talking about this with someone. Oh, I remember where. Um, no, it wasn't this class. But the, the story of Elijah and this, you know, trying to hear God and, and the fire and the earthquake and the wind. And it's the still small voice. Even Elijah, the prophet who is taken up into the heavens, 
has a hard time understanding exactly when God is speaking to him. So I don't think we could say with any certainty what this line of communication looks like. Is it a feeling? Is it a prayer? Is it a voice coming through the heavens? Um, what you say? Or dreams? Oh, I mean, absolutely. That's how they're going to understand. We're going to get so many dream communications in the Old Testament that they understood God spoke to them through dreams. Um, and so I think that is, is probably how we all discern the voice of God. Like we wake up and say, hmm, you know, sometimes we feel like we received a message through our dreams or while we're taking a shower or while we're falling asleep at night or during times of, of prayer. Um, that's probably what these folks are doing too. Yeah. The thing that I think the church, whether throughout time, so often misses is in verse two, in which God says, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. And um, often the church, in whatever form over history that it looks like, often ignores that yeah. and just tries to make it all about them yeah. and not about the other people in the world. And, yeah. And this is very early in the Bible where you say, I'm, you know, basically I'm with you and I bless you so you can bless others. Yeah. And it feels like Jesus really came to call people back to the idea of loving and caring for others. Yeah. That had been lost yeah. for a long time. Yeah, and beautifully I, said. What your God is, the God you worship, what he really wants me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, from us uh, in, I mean, not directly fit for that, but I am blessing you and I love you no matter what you're doing. And this is how you say thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, beautifully said. So, Dan's saying that we, we missed the, the second half of this. Um, where you are blessed in order to be a blessing. And historically, the church missing out on that, thinking that it's the blessing comes and that's the end. We are blessed and highly favored in order to be a blessing to others. Um, and, and you were saying Jesus comes to bring people back to that. Absolutely. Jesus comes onto the scene and says, I've come not to give a new law, but to tell you that this is what the law was about the whole time was about we take what has been given to us or just what we have and we use that to be a blessing to others. That was really beautifully said. Donna? Also really like this in verse 4 and 5, that he was able to convince people by taking God and or speaking, who knows, in heaven. But he was credible enough to get his people to leave their land and go with him. He had followers. So obviously, even if, he, if this wasn't real, real, and it's some a prayer or something. Those people followed him. It was just pretty amazing unless they had nothing to stay for. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of incredibly amazing. Pick up everything, all the okay, we'll Yeah. So Donna, um, looking ahead here to verses four or five, saying Lot follows <laughs> Abram. So this this blessing, this promise was convincing enough that Lot too was willing to leave his own land. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see this um, verse three cited a lot by uh, Christian Zionists, an apologist for the mm. regime in Israel, about the need to provide, you know, uh, support for, unconditional support for, for you know, Israeli occupation and, and war and, and genocide. Um, so that's, that they, and it says you, he's talking to Abram, but they extrapolate and you know extend it to like all of uh, uh, members of the Jewish faith, um, and it's really really problematic. Yeah. Um, I just finished uh, reading uh, Pastor uh, Milker Isaac's book uh, uh, from the other side of the wall, and it's a theology of liberation that's rooted in the experience of Palestinians, especially Christians, um, and he really uh, kind of under uh, uh, criticizes or undermines the the argument that the covenant is especially through you know, the theology of the land the land too um that there's uh, that it's um it's eternal you know and that it's um it's it's, it's unconditional that there's also kind of like what you were saying there's also something we're supposed to do on our side which is 
many justice. Mm -hmm. It's very um, can be compelling argument. Oh, incredibly. I would say this is the beginning of all the trouble because we're talking about the three Abrahamic religions, so this is the start of the whole mess. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's thanks, Toby, and and Ben. Just thinking of that, absolutely, this is complicated. So Ben was pointing out that he has seen this text used within Zionist arguments that the promise of the land is eternal and therefore demands support no matter what. And, you know, this is something, if we were to go from Genesis into the story of the Exodus, you know, the Exodus is lifted up as this great narrative for all oppressed peoples, but actually not all oppressed peoples. There are so many Palestinian liberation arguments that complicate the story of the exodus the exodus the promised land is to bring them in to slaughter the forebears of the modern day palestinians and so how can we lift up this text in this beautiful way that a lot of other communities do and kind of complicate it so the pastor he was referencing was a pastor a christian palestinian who was here in claremont um, giving a presentation a couple months ago if anyone had a chance um, to see his presentation um, but there is a lot of, of ways in which we have to question this theology of the land. And there are a lot of biblical passages that are ushered forward to kind of support this eternal ownership of the land. Um, but as you are meant to point out, it's always geared toward, you know, these eternal arguments, I don't think, have any theological weight. Um, but even if you try to usher them forward, it's always supposed to be geared towards being a blessing to others. How can we have just and equitable relationships with our neighbors? It's always meant to be the point. And we're talking like all we know now is Abraham and the Canaanites. So if he's meant to be a blessing, it's to the Canaanites. There's no one else at this point. Yeah, Rick. What does it mean? I will bless you. What does bless mean? Mm. <laughs> In, in you, all of the, the families of the earth shall be blessed. And I need some help in understanding that. Wow. <laughs> uh, a, a question, you know, the hashtag blessed prosperity gospel. <laughs> what does it mean to be blessed? That's the question that Abraham's going to figure out. It's a question the Israelites are going to wrestle with. Um, so let's talk about it. Yeah, Toby. It's very ironic, considering the Holocaust and the dispersal of the Jews throughout the world, uh, uh, Roman occupation, et cetera, et cetera. What is that? What was the blessing? Wow, wow. So Toby's saying, you know, what was the blessing when you look historically and you've got Assyrian and Babylonian um, destruction? exile, Roman occupation, and, you know, modern day times, the Holocaust. If that's a blessing, who needs a curse? <laughs> if that's a blessing, who needs a curse? Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, we're trying to answer Rick's question here with that comment. So if that's the reality, what is the blessing? Yeah, Wendy? I kind of grew up with the idea that um, the blessing is, from Abraham's perspective, is all the people that came from Abraham. Abraham. I mean, when you think about it, Christianity is a huge, there's a lot of people in the world that are Christian. Yeah, yeah. Both, both all of those. And yeah. then on top of that, if you combine that with the Jews and you combine that with, with uh, the Muslims, there's a whole lot of people that are blessed from Abraham. Mm -hmm. So when he's saying the blessing is the proliferation of humanity, yeah, yeah that certainly ties into our be fruitful and multiply commandment yeah. from earlier in the book. Yeah, Donna? Well, I think that's going to be really what it's about a lot. But also, isn't this supposed to be a better land that they're going to for some reason? Because if you convince all of us people to go to that land? So Donna said, is, is the blessing potential a better land? Yeah, I mean, we're going to see that. Um, we're going to have so many forays starting in Genesis already going into the land of Egypt, going into a foreign land. And so even land wise, it doesn't always work out to, to Toby's point. I mean, we're coming up on 400 years of 
of Israelite slavery in Egypt. How is that a blessing? Yeah. Great question, Rick. No, but we're gonna we're gonna tease that out through the book, and in part, the answer is gonna be divine presence. Um, that God, an understanding of Yahweh's presence, an understanding of a divine human relationship, is the blessing, and having that understanding of what relationship looks like creates the blessing that we then give to others by being in relationship with those around us, even the foreign nations, even the Canaanites. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Um, Rosa, right? Okay. Um, that's, yeah, absolutely. The persistence of God to not give up on the call of Abram. This is, we're, this is call story number one. <laughs> Chapter 15 is going to be the other major call. God's going to call again and again, the persistence of God. Diane, you were saying that this relationship between God and humanity, God gives the blessing. And it's not this sort of tit for tat expectation, but this desire for those blessings to then flow outward. Um, I've mentioned several times already, we'll, we'll dig into this deeper, um, this idea of the language used for covenant, especially with Abraham is the same language that's used for treaties that are established between a vassal and a suzerain or kind of the, the, the ruler and the ruled. Um, but there are key differences here, which are, yes, God has expectations for how the covenant should be upheld. But what changes is that God's side of it is unconditional, that even if that's broken, God will continue to persist, continue to be faithful. But there are expectations for how we understand that relationship. All right. Anything else? I'm just yeah. thinking of uh, Mary. Um, who basically told she blessed similar language, and then is also barren. I mean, there's sort of a oh gosh. Well, thank you for raising that because that's another reference to Abraham as the Magnificat. Um, and so Shirley was just saying, thinking of Mary and her barrenness and this idea of you know the Christ child coming out of this uh, barrenness. But when Mary finds out she's pregnant and sings this Magnificat that the child in her womb will upturn those who think they are powerful uh she says that this is the heritage of abraham she references this um and she, she knows that her you know historical character hard she knows this isn't going to be all good <laughs> surely mary knows it's not going to be all good yeah um and here as abram is leaving his land Going into the unknown, no reason to believe the promise. Thinking of the words of Jesus, those who try to save their life will lose it, but those willing to lose their life will receive it. Yeah. I read a segment from a book a long time ago talking about God's call to marry the various sons of Jesus. And it says, what if Mary was not? first call that God had sent, but Mary was the first one who said yes. Oh, <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Huh, that's, that's very interesting. I never heard that before. Um, that's the one who sits around thinking a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What if Mary was not the first one called, but the first one who said yes? <laughs> that's powerful. All right. Like I said, a lot in three verses. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the oak of Moreh. 
At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. All right. So Abram heeds the call of God at 75 years old to go. More language that's extremely problematic and complicated to Ben's point. A promise to your offspring, I will give this land when we're just told the Canaanites were in the land. Um, it is common practice at this time to build altars. Uh, there's no temple, there's no tabernacle. And so you build an altar to say, this is a place where I experienced the presence of God. And so a lot of our characters in Genesis are going to build these altars. Um, yeah. There's so again specific about marriage and kids and how you go to the adoption there. What is the name of that place now? Is it Negev still? Or is it yeah, 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 yeah. Early names or something else? Yeah, yeah. This is like a, a wilderness desert region. Yeah. A lot of these names are still the names. Yeah. So why is this specific about that? Why being so specific about it? Uh, for people to have a mental picture in their mind, I think, as they hear these stories being told of where Abram was. Yeah. Um, this phrase is very interesting. Pitched his tent. Um, when John 1 gives us this birth narrative so different than what we get in Matthew and Luke, where it's this theological treatise, it will say God came and lived among us, um, but the phrase is God came and pitched his tent among us, um, is what the Greek actually is, um, that it is a, a dwelling. So to pitch a tent, again, is kind of like this altar building. You pitch your tent in the place where you experience God, and the tent will later become the tabernacle. Invoked the name of the Lord. This God can somehow be named. There's a personal relationship. It's not just an unknown God, but this God can be named and called upon. All right. Questions or comments about this? So what happened to the Canaanites uh, if they were in the land when then the Lord said, well, when we get to Joshua and Judges, uh, they will be slaughtered <laughs> in really gruesome passages. Yeah. So we're not there yet. Oh, definitely. So I've, ser slavery and, and servitude is very much in play. Yeah. Humans are possessions. All right. Yeah, we're not there yet, Rick. Uh, what's really interesting, though, is that the Israelites ethnically are Canaanites. Um, there's not really a big difference at this point um, between all of these people living in the ancient Near East. Yeah. But it's going to be a small, I mean, the, it's the Hebrews. We're not, the, we're not the Israelites yet. This is the Hebrew people, similar to the Edomites, who are all in this region. Tom? Uh, for the, the uh, phrase, uh, pitch this tent, is there, is there a sense, would there have been a sense of like um, temporariness versus permanence in that? Like, was, there, was that in contrast to a more permanent? Kind of yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question from Tom is, is pitched his tent meant to imply that there is a temporariness to this arrangement rather than more of a permanence? Um, definitely. You pitched your tent um, is a way to kind of claim that land. But as soon as you take up the stakes, someone else can move in and you're on to the next place. That contrast is a bit. Itself. Like, that the house, house of, god? of god yep 
So Beit El would be the house of God. Yeah, there you are. Uh, it's just, I didn't have a strong memory of this uh, particular scripture, but the idea of pitching tent. I have, for well, probably 30 years, been very involved with the ministry and uh, literature profession. Uh, I teach class Saturday morning for two and a half hours wow. on Zoom, but they don't build churches. They have um, a circle of what the concrete had. And their worship center is a tent. It's a pay frame yeah. shape. And the church is called the Exodus Church. It reaches out to the very lowest of the untouchables mm. with the Christian message. And everyone that's there is you know, worship centers at their school. They build schools, but not churches mm. because it would road, you know, the faith and then go down uh, the pathway out of oppression. But this tent is so visual and important to every sense of mm. visit. Um, and of course, they're thinking more of Moses, but I see it going back mm -hmm. to this point. You know, Moses mm. taking mm. people out of slavery. Yeah. Egypt, but this has even further back implication that God is with us in this tent. Um, yeah. Uh, this is Witnessing Ministries? Yes. Yeah. So an organization that Diane supports is going to be at Alternative Christmas. Is that right? Is that finalized? Yeah, that, excellent. Yes, it will be the first Alternative Christmas. Okay, excellent. Um, saying that this organization that builds schools in India to reach the Dalits um, uses a temporary worship space. It's an A-frame, a tent, hearkening back to both the time of Moses, but you're saying also this experience of pitching a tent. They began the first thing that was bringing the gospel. But when they began building, they knew that the only way to help the people beyond faith was education. And their people were not treated well in any school setting. Uh, so they built schools for a safe environment. Yeah, building I'm schools. Giving your pitch. <laughs> All right, coming up. We're a month away from alternative yeah. Christmas. Thank you. Um, yeah, just seeing education as a means towards advancement to humanity absolutely um and, and we're, we're going to get this idea um you know the, the jewish practice of sukkot of of rebuilding the temporary tents that as they traveled through the wilderness they pitched tents every place they went with the belief that god's presence didn't have to be at bethel only the house of god um but god's presence could travel god's presence could be on the move you didn't have to be stationary. God would come with you wherever you traveled, wherever you went. That's the idea of pitching a tent. So good question, Tom. Good follow-up. Anything else there? Let's, we'll read one more passage. Take us to the end of the chapter. Okay. Ah, major themes that we will see repeated again and again. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful, when the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called to Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him, and they set him on his way with his wife and all that he had. Okay, like we say every week, we got to... 
break down the patriarchy in each passage. Um, so there's a lot here. God gives the blessing. And to Toby's point, to Rick's point, then there's famine. The blessing isn't you have everything you ever need immediately. Um, that's not the blessing. The famine comes. Now, once there's famine, and we're going to see famine again and again, um, we're going to have the famine where Jacob and his sons need food, and so they go down to Egypt because someone, the second command, has created a stockpile of food. It turns out to be Joseph, and they're able to eat. Um, and so the work of God is kind of this multi-generational long game. They're going to go back to Egypt to receive the food that they need. Um, but then Egypt's going to become the land of slavery. But then it's going to be the site of the Exodus and God's rescuing. So it's just this long, eternal, species-long relationship between humanity and God. Um, so there's famine. They go down to Egypt. There he is an alien that's going to speak to later. God says, when you come into your land, remember the alien because you know what it was like to be an alien in Egypt. He goes and he's afraid that he's going to be killed because it's a free-for-all. If you kill someone, you can take their wife. He doesn't want that to happen. So he's willingly allowing Pharaoh to take Sarah as his wife anyway. And the result of this is he's getting richly blessed with all the sheep and oxen and donkeys and slaves. This huge uh, uh, dowry that's coming to him. Uh what is going to be implied here is a lack of trust, because this is actually going to happen again. We're going to get a second story of this happening. Um, and God's going to take um, Abram to account for not trusting that he will be protected. If I've told you that you're going to be a blessing and you don't yet have descendants, trust that I will get you to that point. And so it's a question of how is God going to carry out God's promises and how do we trust in those promises without taking matters into our own hands? A little call ahead to the plagues of Egypt where Pharaoh is stricken with a plague and then Abram is sent out. So we're not going to linger in Egypt this time. Um, strange passage. It's one of, uh, of several, so we're going to get again with Abram and Sarah, but then we're going to get again with other characters as well of this saying that someone's your sister and not your wife. Um, questions or comments about this passage? Well, yeah, Shirley? If, I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff in here, but, <laughs> but the, the largest uh, authority figure at that time, the largest kingdom was Egypt. And so in a sense, this is a possibility of Egypt becoming familiar with the new God of Abram. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm an you know, Egypt you know, lover, so it's like any time I see that God could come to them and speak to them and say, hey, you know, there's a different attitude than whatever you have. Try something new. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Um, and, and thinking of that, uh, it, it surprises me that the Pharaoh didn't just give this chance. Yeah, yeah, great observation. It ties into what Shirley was saying. Um, this idea that there's this encounter between Egypt and Abram and Abram's God. Um, and the result is the Pharaoh has reason to be fearful at this point or respectful towards um, Abram and Abram's God. And you're saying the Pharaoh could have kept the wife and doesn't. Yeah, something interesting is going on in that interplay. There was a point when, when Egypt was ruled by a Pharaoh who, who was a monotheist. And so just the idea that that started to maybe come into play through, if any of this literally happened, then that would have you know, been an authority. Yeah, surely pointing out that there's a period in history when Egypt becomes a monotheist, the worship of Ra, the sun god. What is the relation chronologically between 
the, the Egyptian monotheism? Yeah, good question. Um, I think I was taught that the Egyptians were the first one of the pharaohs and very Egypt being one of the first monotheistic communities. Yeah. yeah. I would guess later because I don't know if the poetry he wrote was very similar to the time of Moses. Yeah. So surely saying that's probably developing later. Yeah. I mean, we, we have guesses historically that, you know, the Exodus is happening at the time of Ramses II. Um, so we have kind of some clues as to potential timelines here. I don't have a full picture in my mind. We yeah. remember there was a succession of hierarchy of gods during that time. And he was starting to put a god above all this, like that is the Tula Allah. The main god, the Amun yeah. god, something like that. But anyway, they were starting to have that idea. Well, there's millions of gods. This is the god of cheerful or whatever, but this is the mm. over god. Mm. So I think they were getting to that too. Yeah. So just yeah, this is great. A great discussion of the potential influences with Egypt of monotheism. All right. Um, I'm going to stop us there, and um, this class will be on hiatus next week because we're going to have a different speaker um, with us. So it's someone who works with orphanages in Russia, and since the war in Russia, um, since the war in Ukraine. Um, has been doing a lot of work with Ukrainians. And so he's um, going to just present about his work. Um, and so that will be next Sunday during this time for all who would like to join. And then we'll be back to Bible study the week after. So let me close this with a word of prayer. God, thank you as always for this time to be in scripture and studying and discussing together. Uh, I think our prayer today is that we will hear the blessing that comes out of the barrenness, which is that um, we are called to be a blessing to others. May we live that out um, as best as we can each and every day of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. All right. See everyone online or in the sanctuary for worship. <laughs>